What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? They learn important lessons on the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. This is true for both men and women. Ernst & Young found that a whopping 94% of women holding a C-suite position played sports. Their wins and losses shaped their habits and who they would become. Join me on my journey to sit with some of the brightest executives in the world as we discuss how sports shape their professional trajectory. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, the voice of America's CEO community. I'm your host, Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is longtime president and COO of Waffle House, Bert Thornton. Bert joined Waffle House in 1971 and helped grow the breakfast chain from humble beginnings into a financial and cultural powerhouse. Today, the chain boasts more than 2,000 locations and sells more than 11 million servings of his famous Bert's Chili each year. Through his two books, Find an Old Gorilla, and High Impact Mentoring, Bert shares the underlying keys to a successful company, and he is here to offer them to us today. So grab a bowl of chili and a notepad, because this episode is smothered, covered, and chunked with great content. Instructions that aren't written are simply suggestions. If you were running a market for me, at the end of the day, we'd sit down and we would take a piece of two-part paper and write down what we agreed on that needed to happen. This point, this point, this point, this point. I'd sign it and you'd sign it and would date it. And you'd get a copy and I'd get a copy. And the next time I'm in the market, I don't have to wonder what we talked about or what you're working on. So if you want things to get done, you write down your instructions. Bert, thanks for joining us. Don, it's great to be with you. Reading your story, born in New Orleans, grew up in Tampa, I heard that you recall walking to school, staying late because you just wanted to play sports. You loved to play. You loved being in competitive environments. If you could think back to those years, what do you remember about one of those early opportunities to pick up a ball? What drew you to sports? Great question. When I was eight years old, my daddy gave me on my eighth birthday a football. Now, a football in 1953 didn't look anything like a football today. It looked more like a basketball. <laughs> That's the first time I remember picking up a football and playing catch with daddy in the front yard. I was actually the slow, fat kid growing up. I was the last guy to get picked on the playground, much to my concern. Later on, I wanted to sing, how do you like me now to some of those <laughs> folks, but, uh, I went to a new junior high school and there was no football there the first year. And then when I went to high school, Robinson high school, that was actually a new high school too. First year, they had a very successful season and actually beat plant high school, which were state ranked and the big rivalry. Right. And Robinson beat them by one point. In its second year, the year that I went, I went to two a days, started playing defensive tackle in the 10th grade on the JV team, three days, got brought up. I guess I showed a little scrap and a little potential. Uh, I had just these great coaches, defensive line coach, Tom Mann, offensive line coach, Henry Garcia. Coach Mann always used to say, anytime you think you're hurting the team. Mm. So. I was coached very heavily and started in the first game of that season, the rematch against Plant High School. First play came at me, and that's anytime you think you're hurting the team. Right. So I just went into automatic mode. That tackle went beside me. I turned in, took a step forward, caught the guy, stood him up, made the tackle for a one yard loss. And the crowd went wild and I probably went wilder than they did <laughs> that first play in my first game. That's my most memorable moment. Wow. Well, I'm taking notes over here because you've already given me a little nugget of gold here, right? I love that idea. Anytime you think you're hurting the team, the key 
to being your best, especially in a competitive environment, is to practice, practice, practice. Practice, 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 and let the training take over. Let the training take over. So you went on at the end of high school to Georgia Tech. I did. And, and we reached out to the football department there, and they sent us some great photos, which um, I'm telling you, you look strong in 67. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something phenomenal. And now I understand that many of those teammates that you played with still get together for dinner several times a year. We do, and not just a couple. We get together the 66 team, Kim King, Giles Smith, Billy Schroer, Lamar Wright. Really, really good player. I think at one time we were number three in the nation in 1966, but we still get together three or four times a year. Wow. From a 1966 team. Yeah. When you gather together, group of former teammates, what kind of energy are you still generating all these years later? And give me a story. We call Coach Dodd the whistle, not to his face, of course. Uh, yeah. He had a big tower at Rose Bowl Field, and he would stand on that tower. And if he saw something he didn't like, he'd blow that whistle. We also called him the Gray Fox, also not to his face, because he was about as smart as it gets in football. One time we were playing a team that was ranked well ahead of us, and Coach Dodd's big pregame speech was, men, he always called us men, men, just keep it close to the fourth quarter and I'll think of something. <laughs> Honest and true. <laughs> and there's inspiration. <laughs> so those relationships with all those friends and teammates, the beauty of sports is that those become things that last a lifetime. Right. As you began your career, I love it. You actually, you were working in computer sales and you took a phone call with a business opportunity for a company that your friend's father had founded. Tell me about that call. Waffle House was founded by two men, Joe Rogers Sr. and Tom Fortner. Joe Rogers Sr. was the operator. He actually worked for an organization called the Toddle House. You may not be old enough to remember the Toddle House, which was the first real 24-hour breakfast-style restaurant. The company was owned by the Smith family out of Memphis. Pop, Joe Rogers Sr., we always called him Pop, he ran the Eastern Seaboard for Toddle House, but he couldn't get stock and he wanted stock in the company. So he actually left and started the Waffle House and ended up putting the Toddle House out of business. But don't, don't feel too bad for the Smiths because he calls him Little Freddie when they were meeting in Memphis. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was in his office when he was talking on the phone and kept calling him Little Freddie. Fred, Fred Smith, the chairman of Federal Express. FedEx. Yeah. So Pop and Tom got Waffle House started, but the guy who really put it on the map was Joe Rogers Jr., his son. Joe and I were fraternity brothers, ATOs at Georgia Tech. I went in the Army and went to work for NCR. Joe did the Air National Guard and then went off to Harvard, and he realized that he could make more money in the Waffle House business than he could as an investment banker. When he got back, he got into the Waffle House business, so he started calling his friends. And I was one of the first calls. He said, I need help. I went up there to talk. And the next thing I knew I was flipping eggs and turning hamburgers. That's really how I got in the business. Joe got me back in with the parent company. He ended up as chairman. I ended up as president, but that didn't have anything to do with our relationship. We just, I guess we both outworked everybody else around us. What I love is that leaving the Toddle House to create the Waffle House, it was around this idea that you wanted long-term ownership opportunity. There was this desire not just to work for, but also to be a part of creating something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Most people don't know that Waffle House is employee-owned. It's owned by the waitresses and cooks. We call them salespeople and grill operators, maintenance techs, the office staff, one of the last things that I did before I retired as president. We had a gal in Anderson, South Carolina at number 480. We number them when we build them. Uh, she retired after 30 years. She worked first shift serving bacon, eggs, and coffee from seven to two. And at the end of every year, there were stock options for stockholders where she bought all the stock that she could, which was 5% of her W-2 earnings, her little salary check. And at the end of 30 years, she cashed in and I went up Gave her a hug and handed her a check for $523,000. Wow. First ship Waffle House waitress. Now she put two kids through college on her tips. Wow. 
<laughs> so structurally, you're talking about these things and this idea of how to lead by asking people not just to give themselves to the operation, but rewarding them in the process and encouraging ownership of, as you said before, something bigger than yourself. Yeah. We come in, first thing we do, whether you're a unit manager or the president of the company, you come in and you check the restrooms first, look at the restaurant, make sure everything's good, get behind the counter, wash dishes, bus tables, do whatever you can to aid in the service equation behind the counter. We actually had a situation in Gulfport, Mississippi. I got behind the counter and realized it wasn't working. Something was wrong. Everybody was just, as we say in the South, a half a bubble off a full plum. Everybody was a half a step behind. And I just put my hands up and said, ladies and gentlemen, give us a moment. I called the group over there and I looked around at the name tags. We put stockholder, if you're a stockholder. And I said, everybody on this floor is a stockholder and the value of our stock on this shift is going down. We need to get it together here. And we actually, it was like a huddle. We said, one, two, three, break. And everybody got back to work and it turned into some magic. And the crowd, when we broke, they gave us applause. <laughs> they thought it was very cool. I love it. Well, the whole stockholder concept is so powerful. You mentioned earlier that when you worked for the franchisee, you did it all. Right. How much do you think that benefited you as you climbed the ranks and ultimately became president of the organization? What did actually having served in all these different roles help you as you got better as a leader? Absolutely essential. To this day, if you join the Waffle House team as a manager trainee, your first job is washing dishes and bussing tables. You have to learn the ins and outs of every job for two reasons. One, you have to know it if you want to lead it. But second, you have to have street credit with the people you're working with. You can't go in with a clipboard and say, this is right and this is wrong. Busy hands talk best. If you want to know what's going on, don't sit somebody down across the booth and say, Don, how's it going? Oh, just great, Bert. Everything's fine. No, you go and you help them put up the commissary and you talk while you're putting boxes up. Or you grab a trash bag and you go out and you pick up litter in the parking lot. And you get the good answers. I mean, you get the correct answers. You don't get the stock answers because it's not confrontational. You're sitting on the same side of the table, not the other side of the table. Give me your best recollection of a busy hands talk best moment with one of your employees somewhere along the line, maybe even one that you encountered as you were way up the corporate ranks. I had heard about this bright, fresh, great manager trainee, made a name of himself as a manager trainee. His name's Dave Rickle. Dave managed the Waffle House that was on Northside Drive right next to Georgia Tech. At that time, I was a senior vice president. I think I was probably in charge of the Atlanta market. I used to play something with these guys called the two napkin game where he'd get a napkin and I'd get a napkin. And we did that. He'd write down everything that he saw that needed correcting. And I would too. Usually my napkin was fuller than his napkin, sometimes two napkins. But rather than me telling him what was wrong, that got him to look through his own eyes to see. And he's challenged because he knows I'm looking too. Well, then we got behind the counter and for about an hour, we bust tables, wash dishes, help, help take care of the customers, did a little cooking. And then we went to the back room so I could get to know him a little better. And that's when he asked the question that ended up changing his life and his career forever. He said, Bert, how do I get promoted? simple, Dave, you make yourself the obvious choice. So what ensued was a conversation about basically how to succeed in business. And he listened, he applied. And today, Dave is one of three executive vice presidents, operational executive vice presidents that run some 2000 restaurants in 25 states. His Top revenue line is in excess of $1 billion with a B dollars. And on any given day, he has between thirty and 35,000 people working for him. He's also a great guy, great family man, wonderful person. You make yourself the obvious choice. Yes. I love it. And I love the two napkin game. Busy hands talk best. There's gold in this. I mean, that <laughs> idea that if you want to lead, you can pull people into your office all day long. And that's a conversation in which you're not sitting on the same side of the table. I love that. Right. You got to show up and lead from the front. 
And what a message that would send to all of those in the organization to see the senior vice president washing dishes and busting tables. In the Waffle House system, I am not unique in that regard. The current CEO, Walt Amer, who is also a great guy, Georgia Tech guy, you took all the Georgia Tech guys and gals out of the Waffle House organization, it would crumble to the ground. <laughs> but Walt always says it's difficult to have an inflated opinion of yourself when you spend your day washing dishes, busting tables, and cleaning restrooms. That's what we do. We don't go in directing. We go in to make sure everybody knows we're part of the team. We're there to help and then get down to business after everybody's comfortable with that notion. We'll be back after this. Your business phone service should not be complicated to set up, manage, and use. Nextiva connects your phone system with business apps, AI, and automation on a single platform to run your business. With their easy-to-use dashboard, you will be able to connect with your team and customers all in one place. Nextiva, powering communication across the Pac-12 and now the Corporate Competitor Podcast. Welcome back to Corporate Competitor Podcast. You served in a vice presidential role for nearly three decades, and then you were promoted to president and COO. Now, many people, almost to use the example you were just giving, struggle with remaining content if they don't see a path to the top or to promotion or whatever it might be. How did you keep yourself content during that window of time in which it, it, it may or may not have looked as if that top job would be yours? Yeah, great question. Actually, it wasn't a matter of staying content. I had my hands full. I had a busy day every day. And honestly, I just wasn't ready. Early in my career, I only thought tactically. Boots on the ground, keep the restaurants clean, keep the service great, keep the restaurants staffed, keep everyone happy on both sides of the counter. Not until later in my career did I start thinking strategically. In about the year 2000, Joe Rogers Jr., the chairman, he asked me to reopen our franchise business. We hadn't sold an exclusive territory franchise in 25 years. I said, sure. I went and did that. When I came back into operations after about, I think, 22 months, I had a much more strategic mindset. I focused on people and the basics, but I also thought a great deal about the why and the how instead of just the what. And I implemented a number of very successful programs that worked out to our great benefit. And I guess the success in those initiatives is the reason he chose me to be president and chief operations officer. Once you were selected into that role as president and COO, you went on a tour visiting Waffle Houses all over the country, everywhere that you could reach out and attend. And at each one of these gatherings, I'm told that you actually gave the employees your cell phone number. Is that correct? Sure. We had what we call town hall meetings, which have been made famous lately by politicians. But in our case, we would take one market and bring all of the hourly associates, anybody who wanted to come, waitresses, you know, salespeople, grill operators, manager trainees, managers, district managers, division managers, area vice presidents, senior vice president, everybody was there. And I would pitch them on what Waffle House was doing today, what we were trying to get done. And I would always pitch, buy the stock, buy the stock, buy the stock. Then at the end of the session, we would have a question and answer time. And I would stay there until every question was answered. When that was done, I would always finish by saying, now, if you have a problem, we certainly want you to work through your management team to get the problem solved. But if you can't find anybody who can solve your problem or tell you why it can't be solved to your satisfaction, you call me and here's my cell phone number. And invariably, the guy who reported to me, the senior vice president would say, just before you call that number, take this number down. <laughs> and he would give his cell phone number. And then the area vice president would say, just before you call it. So now these people had everybody's cell phone numbers. And a belief that something was going to get solved. It sounds crazy, but it really solved a lot of problems because it 
completely opened up the channels of communication. I still get a call every once in a while from a salesperson on the third shift in Tuscaloosa, Alabama that, you know, says, Johnny, Johnny's not doing me right again. He's cooking Susie's orders first, you know, but that's okay. I don't get them as often as I used to, but we solve a lot of problems that way before they become big problems. You know, some may not know this, but you are the creator of the famous chili served at Waffle House across the world. You created the recipe in 1983, and they now sell 11 million bowls of Burt's chili each year. Like, what made you believe that Waffle House needed chili? Uh, the chairman made me <laughs> believe that. Now, I was working in Dallas. I was running the restaurants in the Midwest and the Southwest. Joe came out and said, Bert, we've got great products, but we're using a canned chili. In 1980, if you were dumb enough to order chili in a Waffle House, we'd scoop it out of a can and heat it up for you. He said, uh, you're in the chili capital of the world here in Texas. Will you come up with a good recipe for us? And I said, sure. I worked on it for a year. And after a year, I settled on the Louisville, Texas recipe without the bacon and the Tabasco sauce. Bacon didn't do anything for the taste and it just drove the food cost up and the Tabasco didn't work because while I liked it, that chili had to play well in Albuquerque where they put hot green chilies in the scrambled eggs, but it also had to play well in Kansas city where they can't even spell jalapeno, you know, <laughs> think it begins with an H they just don't like hot food there. So we put it in, I was scared to death, but sales went up 22%. I was very grateful for that. And then. One day I was working with our Arkansas franchisee. They were doing a menu change on a Thursday morning. We took the old menus out and put the new menus on 7 a.m. And this gal came up and she said, are you the Burt's? Did you do the chili? Yes, but how would you know that? She said, your name's on the menu. I said, holy smoke. So I went to the back and I could just four cell phones. I went to the back and I called Joe and I said, what have you done? Oh, well, you know, it's all about, you know, just for a job well done. You and I both know you just wanted somebody to supervise the car of the chili for the rest of his life. Cause if your name is on it, you will taste it everywhere you go. You know what? You owned it. I love that. You know, I know you just completed a new book, high impact mentoring, a practical guide to creating value in other people's lives. What is the greatest lesson on mentorship we should learn from you and your life experience? Well, First of all, you, you actually wrote the book on mentoring with John Wooden. And I hope you'll send me a copy because I, unfortunately I haven't read it yet, but I'd love to high impact mentoring is actually the second book. The first book was called find an old gorilla crazy title. But the premise is if you wake up one morning and realize you've got to go through a jungle, it would make sense to find an old gorilla like you or me, because we've got all the scars. We know where all the good paths are and also the quicksand. So it's a leadership book aimed at the mentee. It's an effort to lift folks out of the fog and help them figure out where they are in life, what they really want, not what they think they want, but what they really want and how to find the right people to help them get there. It's been called the rising high achievers guide to what to do next or the emerging leaders handbook. Your friend and mine, my editor and copywriter, Dottie Dehart calls it self mentoring in a box. I like it. So that was aimed at the mentee. High Impact Mentoring, which I co-wrote with Dr. Sherry Hartnett, a marketing consultant and a professor at the University of West Florida. Amazing. We aimed this one, the captain of the relationship, the mentor. We wrote that book because there's a really kind of an ironic need in today's business world. On the one hand, you've got a group of emerging leaders out there who would greatly benefit by the wisdom of a skilled mentor. And on the other hand, you've got this smart, experienced group of business and organizational leaders who could, should, and would fill that bill, but they're not getting together like they should. Many of the rising stars that I've come into contact, they don't know there's a resource like that out there. And if they do, they're just afraid to ask. They're afraid to say, can you have a cup of coffee with me? I need some advice. They think they'll get turned down. That's step one right there. They have to ask. Often we've talked about it. Good mentors aren't out handing out business cards. Exactly. You have to be, as a mentee, willing to go put yourself out on that line. And that's an inhibitor for many. I find that strange, don't you? I do. I think folks like you and me are more prone to ask for help, though. I got to tell you, one of the key components of success is knowing when to ask for help. 
this group of folks out there who can be great mentors, their problem is that they're not in constant search for that fresh talent, which they should be, but they can't find these folks. They can't find this emerging talent because there's no bridge. There's no conduit to put these two together. So that book tries to get those folks together in a productive way. I love that. I think it's so important. Again, we got to find both great mentors and, and willing mentees. You know, many people refer to their corporate organizations as teams. I think it's an overused phrase sometimes, but you both played on multiple teams, including at Georgia Tech, and then you built teams organizationally. We know that there are certain attributes that allow a group of individual contributors to gel together and actually do something special. What are some of the things that you as teacher of other leaders might suggest are the ways they could take individuals and bond them together and create true teams? Great question. Like you, I've noticed that corporations like buzzwords, they try and keep things fresh. They have cute names, employees become team members and groups become teams, but groups are just groups unless you treat them like teams. A group only becomes a team under solid leadership. Great teams are formed when a good leader gets total buy-in on a project or whatever the great effort is. That's essential. People have to understand what they're trying to get done and they have to understand the, the result of success and the benefit to them and the team. Everybody wants to be a part of a winning team and a good leader will make them understand the importance of the effort and the benefit to everyone. And in the end, that's what people want. They want to be a part of something beneficial, not only for themselves, but for other people. For someone trying to build a great team, I, I give them the advice I give in Find an Old Gorilla. There's a whole chapter about the successful leadership model, what successful leaders do and don't do, what they think about and don't think about. And what I said was, if you want to build a great team, the first thing you have to do is put your main focus on your greatest asset, your people. You have to always put them first. People talk about that a lot, but unfortunately, much of that is conversation. You have to put your people first in everything you do. Second, you have to show up and lead from the front. We talked about that. Yeah. You just can't phone it in. You've got to be there. Back in grade school, you used to have the piece of paper and they put the metal filings on top of it. You know, they were in random order and somebody would run a magnet underneath the paper and the metal filings would, as the magnet passed through, would stand up straight and then lay down in order on the back side. Because that's, I think it's the third law of physics, one law of physics, a force moving through a field tends to organize the field simply by its presence. And I tell people that all the time. You're the presence. Go to the spot. Sometimes you don't have to say anything. Just your presence will organize things and get them moving. Another law of physics is a body at rest tends to remain at rest and the body in motion tends to remain in motion unless interfered by an outside force. You're the outside force. If something is static and you want it moving, go to the spot and get it moving. Show up. And the most important thing about directing a team is you have to issue clear and specific written instructions. Mm. Instructions that aren't written are simply suggestions. We put together a program where if you were running a market for me and I went in your market, we would go through your market in a couple of days. And at the end of the day, we'd sit down and we would take a piece of two-part paper and we would write down what we agreed on that needed to happen. This point, this point, this point, this point. I'd sign it and you'd sign it and would date it. And you'd get a copy and I'd get a copy. My copy would go in your file. And the next time I'm in the market, I don't have to wonder what we talked about or what you're working on. I've gone to five markets before I got back to yours. So if you want things to get done, you write down your instructions. And then the last thing is you have to establish deadlines. Mm. Deadlines are essential to getting things done. 80% of the work gets done in the last 20% of the time provided. People need to know how much time is on the clock so they can sprint to the finish. That's what the importance of deadlines is. And you have to follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, endlessly follow up, evaluating, cheering, encouraging, redirecting, and 
passing out consequences, good consequences for good stuff and other consequences for not so good stuff. Very much like football, very much like sports. You know, I love your basic laws of success while reading uh, Find an Old Gorilla. And one of my favorites was you have as number three, always take notes. I have taken pages of notes. It's an honor to have had the chance to listen to your journey, to have learned more about how you engage in teaching and improving others and how sports have played a role in the development of who you are and what you've become. Bert Thornton, I thank you for joining us today and being a corporate competitor. Don, it's a pleasure and an honor. What you're doing is so essential to what's going on in America today. I applaud you for it. And I'm so proud to have been a part of it. Looking at my notes, this line is bolded and underlined. Instructions that are not written are merely suggestions. Bert emphasized the need to lay out clear expectations for your team. And as you heard, that starts with talking on the same side of the table. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager who did that, uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K, how you doing? Hey Don, how you doing my man? Great sir, how are what you? What they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399. But for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.